speaker is Tish. Tish works at Geoscience Australia with the Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa projects. Tish has got a great talk today. He's going to tell us about how they balance open access to data and the security of that data, while the amount of data is absolutely enormous. Please make Tish welcome with all of your digital clicks. Now, Tish has told me that at the end of the talk, he is open to taking some questions on the live stream. So if you've got questions during the talk, then just type them into the chat and one of our other volunteers will pass them up to us. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tish now. Thanks. Um, hi. Uh, the virtual conference experience has this curtain raising thing and I just jump in and talk. It's great to get audience energy, which in live conference, but yeah, this will be, I'll make do. <laughs> so, uh, so I work at, uh, at Geoscience Australia. I've been work using Kubernetes since around 2018, 19, particularly using the AKS platform managed. Uh, I have started using it to doing logistics in Africa. Uh, we used to have jokes about uh, shipping containers, using containers, running in data centers and containers. But anyway, uh, I continued the practice in Geosense Australia when I joined late 2019, still using CAS. I started as a cloud engineer. Uh, currently, I lead a small team of cloud engineers, SREs, DevOps as an assistant director, uh, sort of a freshly minted engineering manager sort of function. Um, yeah, so uh, the, <clears throat> the team does uh, extraordinary work uh, shipping new things and as well as uh, mm, uh, maintaining security of the platform. So we sort of practice <clears throat> uh, the reverse of security as obscurity, security with excessive transparency. So a brief introduction to Digital Earth Australia and Africa, uh, the Australia part mostly in this slide. I got this slide from my colleague Alex, who has done this present similar presentations before. Um, Australia used to download Landsat and data was stored in tapes. Uh, satellite data, uh, satellites actually have tape recorders on them. They actually linearly have headers and trailers and so on. Eventually the data was digitized, uh, making a 30 years of Landsat archive available, 30, 40 years. Uh, it was usually called the uh, Geoscience Australia Data Cube, AGDC, but now it's called the Open Data Cube, new, improved. It's like a suite of open source projects we call the Open Data Cube. Uh, its function is to support government and industry making Earth observation EO data available, accessible, uh, <coughs> usable in Python and other languages uh, hosted in a nice format in the cloud. Um, uh, the similar program uh, is being established in Africa, hence the Digital Earth slash Digital Earth Africa uh, responsibilities that I carry and my team carries. So how do we use Kubernetes? Uh, so Kubernetes is like a newfangled and everyone, even a startup with one, one user is trying to use Kubernetes, we don't. Um, so you run multiple web applications. Uh, we, uh, for people who do GIS image serving, uh, OWS, which has WMS, WMTS protocol serving JPEGs and PNGs from the satellite imagery. Uh, uh, we have Explorer, which is sort of used to be called Dashboard. It's sort of like a BI business intelligence tool to show what data we have, uh, where which days data is missing or something is happening. It sort of does a geospatial temporal catalog viewer sort of thing of what the data holdings are. Uh, I have like uh, hyperlinks in this slides and I will share these slides after on Twitter most likely uh, uh, to have the links to all these projects. We have some sort of pro batch processing workloads. Some of them uh, give them funny names. Coming up with names is fun. Uh, Alchemist, which sort of transmutes data, scene to scene, statistician, which squashes over time. Uh, does product summaries, uh, then classification, which are essentially machine learning classifiers, various different classifiers. A new one has been developed for crop masking in Africa. And we have another sort of workload where we have uh, ephemeral user pod containers with 
Python environment management is a mess, it's difficult. Uh, lots of compiled libraries in our case as well for geospatial processing and creating a stable set of libraries is hard so we make a container available with the libraries that are typically used attached to the data and then you, you ship your code or experimental code to the data instead of downloading the petabytes of data to run your satellite imagery analysis. Um, how we deploy Kubernetes? We deploy Kubernetes using a multi-layered Terraform stack. Uh, basically, all the uh, parts our implementation needs get brought up. Uh, the choice of Terraform is interesting as opposed to a vendor, cloud vendor tool because uh, we aim to be sort of agnostic to the cloud provider. All you need is sort of Kubernetes and a stateful database and uh, sort of a blob store. Uh, to run the stack. Uh, the modules have been open sourced uh, using Apache 2 license. You can, if you follow that hyperlink there, you'll get to the stack. Um, and then uh, we have a few modules in our Terraform which uh, we sort of uh, overlay and run specific patterns we have. Maybe we'll open them up uh, as this pattern gets better documented and used by others as well. So, uh, it's, everything is about graphs, and when I'm an electronics engineer by training, so I used to draw schematics and stuff, I sort of drifted into satellite imagery processing late in my uh, undergraduate degree. I used to work for a small company in Adelaide which did satellite imagery and then did my thesis on similar stuff. But uh, uh, anyway, I'm an electronics engineer how I interpret diagrams and schematics and PCBs, but so I tried to adopt a diagramming tool for our Terraform uh, called Blast Radius, and this is sort of the diagram it produces for, a, a not our stack, but a cloud per se, AWS EKS uh, uh, sort of a Terraform stack. And you can see so many components uh, in, the, in the thing, it's a huge sprawling spider web everywhere. Uh, so it's difficult to communicate all the parts and secure all the parts and ensure that uh, every, everything has least privilege and Terraform itself needs to be given high level access. We'll talk about that a little bit. So how we manage workloads on Kubernetes, which apps get deployed and which is sort of part of the requirements here is uh, we use GitOps with a tool called Flux, which keeps uh, a particular folder in a particular branch of Git in sync with the cluster. So we apply home chart values and Kubernetes manifests in a private Git repo. Uh, the DevOps team can push directly to the development cluster by pushing to the Git rather than uh, performing kubectl apply. Uh, and then they, we can sort of mo go to a production cluster by uh, doing a PR to a master. And we typically ship from development, something we have tested in development to master by cherry picking the changes we want. Uh, so if very, I'm happy and open to suggestions uh, after this, uh, hit me up if you have any ideas about a better Git-like workflow for managing multiple clusters and separating dev staging prod. I currently, they just keep multiplying these clusters, so we currently manage around six or seven clusters in Sydney, uh, Cape Town, Oregon, uh, yeah due to the different workloads and data locality in the different regions. Uh, so this is sort of our doodle I drew one Friday afternoon to sort of communicate how the GitHub stuff looks like. The little slashes you see in there for the different solution provider for the same function. So we have a bunch of GitHub repos where all our open source stuff sits. We have a bunch of big bucket repositories where our private stuff sits. We have a bunch of Docker Hub repositories, and then recently we have just started using ECR a lot more since the Docker Hub rate limits came in to have our container images. Uh, and then we have the Flux agent in the Kubernetes cluster keeping everything in sync. And we just push, push out all of the different Kubernetes constructs to the clusters, uh, PCs, jobs, whatever it needs to be for getting our job work done. So, uh, coming down to what this talk is about, the Asian Shell 8 maturity model is like a 
the, the talk is sort of a square peg round hole talk or I was saying uh, octagonal peg heptagonal hole talk of trying to fit this list of maturity model security framework that the Australian government has to uh, how we actually do it. So this needs a bit of maintenance. So the, the version that uh, this talk is built on is the Linux version of the Essential 8. So you will see bits and pieces of that in, uh, along in my talk. This talk could have been eight slides because it's about eight things, but I have like padded it out a bit. So, so it's more than eight minutes, which is where we are now. Uh, so uh, I've tried to create this sort of uh, satellite imagery specific slides where, where I could to conceptualize a thing. So this is an ESA control center for running lots and lots of satellites. You can see reception stations where the satellite is and satellite footprints and telemetry and this. So this sort of one of the first requirements of this checklist uh, is application control. So you know which applications have been deployed, uh, there's a finite sort of whitelist of them, uh, and then you will basically uh, keep them in check. Uh, uh, look at their behavior at runtime and also make sure they are secure when you put them in. Uh, so all of our applications as we are in Kubernetes are containerized. Uh, we maintain them, as I said, mostly in GitOps in production. So we do do capital apply for experimental things in the staging environment even. And I've started sort of a practice in uh, development to use Minikube and um, a local stack for sort of uh, emulating a cloud environment and developing in there. Uh, it's not fully shippable or documented yet how that will work. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so everything is configured, is version controlled, and we have guard duty, which is sort of looks after the, at the nodes, the traffic at the nodes for malicious usage. So we, it has caught a few things for us uh, occasionally because we don't have 100% control over the application's actual code that runs. I'll talk about that. So this is a sample application using uh, Kletus Lens. One of my colleagues did a screenshot for me for this presentation. Uh, the, thanks, Damien. Uh, so the Airflow is a cron on steroids sort of thing we use in our uh, processing as our processing management tool, workflow management tool. It has lots of different moving parts. It has a web UI where you can see your processes graphically. It has got workers, it has got Redis, it has got uh, uh, sort of a, a scheduler, it, uh, it has got lots of different moving parts, and it, that's sort of what an application typically with lots of services in it in Kubernetes ends up looking like. And then in this particular namespace, so this is the contents of a particular namespace we call processing, um, we don't have separate clusters per type of workload yet. Maybe we'll do that, then instead of having six clusters, we'll have 18 clusters, but not there yet. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's sort of typically what an application with its sub-services looks like to us. Uh, so this one is a, a, a patchwork of fields using a particular Landsat 8 product we call the GeoMedian. We'll talk more about the GeoMedian, it has been uh, the topical thing for the recent few few months or six months now it's difficult to do this complex maths at scale we'll talk about that uh, so this is uh, this obviously considers patching so we try to have to patch everything as much often as possible it's a never-ending battle to uh, patch the container libraries system libraries python libraries which is mostly what we use for our development uh, all of the Open Data Cube project is mostly Python, uh, as like a lot of the modern data science stuff is. There is a lot of C, C++, Fortran underneath the iceberg, the, the, the top layers where people are most productive is usually Python. That's like a recurring thing with Python. I myself started using Python during my PhD when I couldn't manage my MATLAB licenses anymore and to much annoyance of my supervisor I was like yeah I'm just gonna do all of my stuff in Python. Uh, so anyway, so a lot of the satellite imagery processing is done in Python um, and then we also have JavaScript libraries in our containers mostly for 
Jupyter uh, Hub uh, sort of stuff where uh, you have the ID in Jupyter Hub running in the foreground and Lodash and Vega and all these libraries to keep on bringing things. Uh, we try to patch them as soon as possible, so you can, uh, I think we have a two-week time window we try to patch within, so uh, this is one of the container images, so as I was saying, uh, we have excessive transparency, all of our containers are built on GitHub in public repositories, and then uh, GitHub Actions push them into Docker Hub, and then we synchronize from Docker Hub using uh, uh, Lambda into our ECR, uh, so, uh, my colleague Mike wrote uh, a sort of a GitHub action to scan all the containers using Trivi. Uh, he sort of looks after the security side specifically, uh, and uh, it can, you can log now in GitHub. It's a new security tab where you can see any CVs that have popped up in your container scan results. It's pretty cool. You can see libc things, you can see stuff around ini, and Vega is the JavaScript one. So all sorts of fun there. Uh, this particular image is not a satellite image and that sort of stands to re like demonstrate this part of essential aid being difficult to map to uh, what we do in practice. So there's a macro image, you know, the people who do photography it's like zoomed in high, uh, high detail of a small object and obviously it's about macros. So one of the points in the essential aid list checklist is uh, you thou shall not have macros uh, so the we don't really have anything in our particular deployment uh, the Linux uh, essential 8 sort of version acknowledges this and has this general hardening of Linux part of where the macros point dot point sits and it talks about upper merge, Linux, uh, list privilege, uh, 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 shipping the logs out. So th th those are things we do practice uh, in our design. So I probably should have included a thing about logs. So we use um, uh, FluentBit uh, for our logging in Kubernetes these days. And then we ship the logs out uh, to S3. Uh, currently in the same account, perhaps in the future in a separate account. Uh, I think the government has a seven year retention for things, but I'm not sure the Kubernetes logs are covered by that. Uh, we, yeah, so, uh, so that, that's sort of something that needs to be adapted. More relevant is the recently published uh, Kubernetes Seek Security White Paper. So uh, we, read, we have read this as a team a couple of times. And it's like a massive list of to-dos for us, or just mapping out our things in detail uh, for us as a, as a result of reading this white paper a few times, both as deployed and also as uh, supply chain sort of stuff for how our containers are getting built, where all the dependencies are being sourced. Uh, and yeah, so it's a, like I remember Lemore's talk today, they have uh, have 15,000 repositories. So one time when I was previous work, we were looking at a front-end application in React and there was a requirement to scan dependencies and we did so and we ended up with around 2,000 NPM packages in this massive tree of things. But anyway, sourcing, uh, it has been topical recently, the supply chain and sourcing and dependency management, but uh, yeah, and also the sort of relevant thing. Uh, the the diagrams. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm seeing a question here. The diagrams were generated using uh, uh, blast radius for Terraform specifically. Uh, I can take questions at the end of this. Uh, so the uh, the next point is about hardening. So the, this one I picked uh, Alice Springs, a hard part of Australia to live in. I don't know if that metaphor translates, but. Um, Australia is, has pretty good deserty landscapes <laughs> to pick from for hard places to live. Uh, so we try to do static container analysis. Uh, I showed the Trivi one before. <clears throat> in the past or in concurrently, we have used uh, other container scanning tools like Player Scanner. Uh, ECR has a built-in scanning tool. We just recently got a Docker Hub paid subscription, which gives us SNCC 
as a scanning tool, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, snake, sneak. Um, uh, and then we also are sort of looking to implement Falco and other runtime uh, scanning solutions uh, so that uh, you can look at the behavior and the privileges and syscalls being made by the containers. Um, uh, for the Python code analysis, one of our projects is looking at using Bandit uh, for Python. Uh, it's part of the PyCQA suite of things that comes with PyLint and other, other things you love. Uh, and I'm super opinionated about how you write your Python. Um, and then uh, the like the black sheep in our cluster is Jupyter Hub. It's a specifically the Jupyter Hub user pods. Uh, if anyone has used Jupyter Hub, it's like this uh, multi-user shared uh, Jupyter workspace for developing interactive notebooks. Uh, you use that to uh, create uh, the uh, notebooks and maintain them, but it lets you add any anything you want uh, in the Python application, and that has caused uh, issues for us in the past. Uh, so yeah, so we can't really harden that as such, but you can watch from the periphery. Um, and the application is in the uh, have to reduce the AWS resources you can access, so not give you access up to the AWS resources, and also pod security policies, uh, which which we are uh, we currently have at node level. It's sort of a future to do thing. Uh, so the next uh, 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 slide I have is another sort of graph. Uh, we use Cilium for our network. Uh, firewalling uh, sort of approach in the cluster. We haven't adopted a full-blown service mesh yet, which bring, which I used to use, uh, which brings nice to observability tools like this, like Yali. Uh, so our user pods have to uh, be uh, uh, looked at it from the outside and what connections they are making. And this is a view from Hubble, uh, which is the observability tool that Selim has for what the, or what the Jupyter Hub their things are doing and talking out to the internet. Uh, so the next one is obviously where I am currently in Canberra and sort of is about administration, administrative access, reducing administrative access. Uh, so this is also a product that our uh, Digital Earth Australia produces called uh, Water Observations. Uh, uh, this is sort of the Lake Burley Griffin and which, uh, how much of it is filled with water at different times of the year during uh, different times using in a season. So restricting administrative privileges. So our AWS account level uh, uh, access is uh, managed through SSO. We are moving towards AWS SSO. Uh, IAM credentials are least privileged. Database credentials are least privileged. Kubernetes credentials are namespaced and uh, Flux has high, higher privilege access or is, uh, and developers do not have high privilege access. Try to use non-root containers and just try to do least privilege everywhere uh, as possible. Uh, we're looking at uh, one of the things that too, like there's like a bootstrapping issues here with Terraform to start up the clusters and so on. So looking at list privilege for Terraform as well. Currently we have a hunt crafted list privilege, but we're looking at and analyzing the cloud trail logs uh, and then looking at uh, programmatically defining uh, the IAM credentials using things like policy sentry. Uh, the satellite data is not always, sorry, at point six, the satellite data is not always like the way we see the world. There are extra bands. Uh, uh, it's like so having sort of a superpower. I don't know if people watch Ghost in the Shell, like being like Bateau, where you can see in ultraviolet and microwaves and so on. So um, this one is a synthetic aperture radar, which is sort of close to my heart. I did my PhD and spent five years of my life looking at this stuff. But anyway, uh, this is vegetation index derived from a Japanese satellite called Alos Pulsar over farms in the 
Nile Delta in Egypt. Uh, so uh, this is another sort of patchwork story. Uh, sorry, skipped ahead one. So we have to patch the operating system. So patch the nodes underneath. Uh, that's what it means for us for Kubernetes or means to me. Uh, so we keep an eye using the SSM for the latest patches being applied and uh, rebuild and regularly roll our instances, use manage instances is future to do. And maybe we'll start adopting cut down, currently use Ubuntu best nodes. Uh, we'll probably start adopting bottle rocket or other container uh, specific run, uh, downsized MIs and distributions, so to say. Um, so some of the fun stuff we have had during doing patching is uh, with like, uh, so you also have space taken up in your node and uh, some of the applications may be using empty dir for their uh, processing and stuff. So we had uh, one of the patches just take up slightly more space and the application was using empty dir to uh, put create some temporary data started failing more it ran for uh, for a few test cases during the smoke test but when the, it started running 400 satellite scenes per day some of the scenes had more content than others and it started failing due to running out of node local storage uh, and i had to like spend one weekend fighting that uh, and then uh, some of the we have had networking issues we have sort of uh, lodged issues with the aws vpc cni for making cilium work nicely uh, and then oh, we also have interdependency between services as they roll out. So uh, had to have a different kube uh, 2 im and which manages our DNS entries has to come before and so on. Uh, and we have to manage those dependencies when rolling the nodes. Uh, if a core node with a service like that goes off, then other services may fail. So we need to make sure we sort of manage our dependency graph of the services uh, properly. So this one is uh, the confluence of Niger and Benue rivers in Nigeria from Landsat 8. Uh, again, the Geomedian product. Uh, there are bits of uh, overblown sand in this sort of image. Uh, and then uh, this one is about multi-factor things joining together. It's about MFA, essentially. Uh, so we use MFA wherever we can in our supply chain and in the management tools, uh, AWS console, GitHub, Bitbucket, Docker Hub. Uh, the, the CLI tool we use for managing the Kubernetes cluster or administering one, uh, IE kubectl, uh, we sort of uh, use AWS Vault to manage our credentials and AWS Vault has support for MFA as well in the CLI tool. Um, so that, that's sort of, we apply it as much as we can uh, in our, in our uh, ac accessing the cl cluster and the supply chain process as much as possible. I'm trying to sort of uh, uh, leave time for questions. So I'll ask a lot of questions near the end, I hope. <laughs> the next one we have here is uh, uh, swath of scenes in a day uh, captured over Africa using our, a couple of satellites from the European Space Agency, the control center we had in the beginning called Sentinel 2A and B. And this, uh, this particular point, which is the last one, and so we'll have plenty of time for questions, I guess, is about uh, daily backups. So we do not run stateful things in Kubernetes, so try not to currently. Uh, we run them in managed services, so there are hourly backups for the database services. S3 is where most of our investment, I guess, is, is the most cost center, uh, S3 and now Azure Blob Store. Uh, is uh, so we have like a multi-factor delete for the buckets. We have uh, versioning with seven-day retention. So we have a lot of lot of data in S3. So that sort of is hopefully redundant. We also have the copy of the data at the NCI in Canberra as well, and in various uh, space agencies for the Africa deployment. So uh, the uh, EBS volumes that are there attached are not backed up because we don't have any stateful services, as I said. Uh, 
and uh, so the developer machines or the Jupyter Hub, which has got uh, some notebooks and attached storage, uh, attached to user pods, don't have backups. They're considered ephemeral and still working on the uh, still working on the service level or the user agreement terms and conditions to say that we do not provide any backup for any code in development in the notebooks. Kubernetes is sort of still maturing in the stateful way. I, when we were looking at scaling our database, uh, we sort of uh, ha could move from standard Postgre, which we were on, to Aurora or to uh, something like a Postgre operator from Crunchy Data and run Postgre in Kubernetes. We chose not to go to for our main database uh, using the running database and Kubernetes approach because we are unsure of the stateful, how well stateful applications will run in Kubernetes. We may still explore Postgre in Kubernetes uh, uh, for a developer database, which can be attached to Jupyter Hub and thrown away sort of thing because our design has a lot of the data in S3, but the indexes all sit in Postgre. So it's difficult to develop without access to an easy Postgre database. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I'm right or wrong. Someone may correct me regarding the latest thing with Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is not ready for stateful yet. There are things being done, but there are no official big patterns for doing stateful things, especially databases in, uh, in, in Kubernetes. And uh, oh, obviously nothing is perfect, so we have got a few deficiencies and to-dos and things to maintain in the future uh, in our infrastructure. Uh, create and maintain security policies, constant battle to apply patches, uh, fix up things, uh, uh, look for uh, CI tooling to uh, scan uh, Python, JavaScript, whatever we have in our code base. Uh, it's difficult to manage lots of IAM credentials and lots of groups, uh, so just make sure. Uh, yeah. And then uh, the uh, this one is sort of a la dirty laundry list, I guess. So we have had uh, uh, the uh, security incidents in the past. One of the ones that has happened while I was there was uh, someone logged into our Jupyter Hub environment and was mining Monero, and that was picked up by guard duty as network traffic, unexpected network traffic, and we sort of adopted Cilium to act as a firewall to sort of whitelist all of the other things that are standard for scientific development uh, that people could go out to. Uh, we had developer machines uh, acting as our exit nodes, uh, which we sort of threw away the dev machine. Uh, we have had, uh, insecure passwords and uh, uh, machines being compromised. So, so, sort of a lot of this stuff is developer box, but we do need to secure access to the cluster. So we need to have security in the developer boxes as well so that uh, cluster access cannot be escalated to. Um, we, are, we are constantly under attack using for the web services, especially and Jupyter Hub uh, for people scanning for vulnerabilities. Um, I don't have a log for our web application firewall WAF, uh, but we sort of hide things behind uh, load balancers and WAF to sort of mitigate that a little bit. Uh, this was a classic example of a list. So there is a, this sort of write up called defenders thinking lists and attackers thinking graphs. And this was a classic list. So if you check off things and you feel you're safe, but you're not safe, you need to see the relationships between the different things and uh, how privilege can be escalated as we go. Um, so yeah, so we need a constant work to make sure we retain, uh, retain security uh, uh, sort of the balance between convenience and control of something perfectly secure is perfectly unusable, especially for science users who want to iterate and experiment constantly. Uh, this is like a success story, I guess, the reverse of so finishing off on a good note. Uh, we have this algorithm called Geomedian, which you have seen sort of referred to. There is a paper for it. There's a hyperlink there for the paper for it. Uh, and then uh, we ran this for all of Africa for one year, and it took maybe four or five hours, and it was consuming on the uh, spot instances in Oregon, 4,000 CPUs and around uh, 
50, 60 terabytes of RAM, and that worked smoothly. Uh, we will probably run it at an even bigger scale because we had made some errors in our code and we only ran it at like 20 meters instead of 10. For So it's it will be probably four times bigger when we run it next soon. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, we have made some code improvements. Maybe it will be more efficient. And then uh, the, I'm, I'm sort of at the end and I'm happy to take questions. So I'll leave this here uh, around sort of security and how humans are the weakest point in, you can se secure the systems automatically as much as you want, but humans still remain the weakest point in, uh, in getting, uh, managing access and ultimate security. Yeah, I'll take, happy to take questions. Thank you, Tish. Oh, that talk was great. I have to say, I love the idea of excessive transparency and those numbers of those massive numbers of nodes and RAM just made me grin. It must be such an exciting place to work. Yeah, um, it is. It is. <laughs> we've got about eight minutes for questions. Oh, um, that's good. And uh, we've got one question from the audience and I've, um, as I tend to do, I've got a uh, we'll start with a question from the audience, and that was just what do you use to generate the diagrams that you showed? This question came up pretty early. They might have been referring to that big node diagram of all the components. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of rolling back to it. Um, yep. Uh, so a couple of diagrams in these slides. Uh, the first one I had was this one. Uh, so this one was generated using a tool called Blast Radius. It's written in Python. It basically uh, is a mix of uh, GraphViz and uh, D3.js for the front end. It takes a Terraform graph and then renders it to a GraphViz file and then has a little UI, which lets you filter and navigate and highlight sections and cut the graph a little bit. Uh, cool. It's great for exploring big stacks. Excellent. Um, I was wondering, so you talked about patching and lots of upgrades. With so many com components that we can see in that diagram, how do you check that any one component that hasn't, for whatever reason, needed a change recently from a, like a business perspective, how do you check that it doesn't have any unpatched issues that are just kind of lurking there because it's been a while? <laughs> Yeah, so we do have some support. So our team, our uh, the organization has around 100 plus AWS accounts under the organization and our team manages maybe seven or eight of them. And there is a, a sort of a enterprise cloud enablement team which has tooling applied to the accounts which sort of looks after uh, the other parts that are not under our direct responsibility. And one of the things they provide are these dashboards using the system manager, where you can see what is uh, what has been not been patched, what are the vulnerabilities in other parts of the system. So mm -hmm. that I don't specifically implement those. Uh, I do have a team member who works closely with them and is sending things that we that are in our stack and they haven't covered back to them to apply across the accounts because we don't actually have root access to the organization account to manage all of them. Nice. That, that answer leads really well into my next question, um, which is, this is a really large environment. Can you tell us roughly what the size of the team is? And also, I'm interested in the temporal nature. How long has it taken to get this environment, you know, from an initial idea up to what we're seeing today? Sure. Um, uh, I, it's my first year working in government. I've worked in private industry before. It's my a year and a bit. The team has been fairly stable for a while I've been there. That it's five people in this team, the team I, I work with and lead. Uh, the, I would say it has taken many years to get to this stage. The AGTC has been running maybe for 10 years. The DevOps team has been around for three years or so. There have had been previous iterations. If you look in the GitHub histories of the stack on ECS, and then using your our own nodes, using our own Kubernetes one, and then when KKS was available on EKS. Uh, so yeah, so it has taken maybe three years to get to this stage. Cool. Um, we've got a question from Peter Nunn. 
Uh, Peter wants to know if it's possible to find this stack somewhere so that they can try and apply it to their infrastructure. Yep, uh, so I'll go back. Uh, sorry, I'm just jumping around. I have links and I will probably share the slide. So this hyperlink here uh, leads to the stack. So maybe it's showing up in tiny font in the bo bottom. Yes. yes, I was just yeah. leaning forward for that. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I will. I'll probably just drop out of this presentation. The screen is still shared, so I have nothing else in this tab. So I'll just follow that link through. Yeah. So this is the Terraform that we run. Nikita is the lead. I, when I joined, I worked with her to sort of support. I can see there have been lots of contributors on this over the years. Uh, the stack is shared with uh, CSIRO as well. They run several instances of it all over the world. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, been a shared project. So if you want to look at the insights of how, how this has come together, you can see how long it has been running, I guess, so, uh, contributors. Um, Nikita <laughs> would be the major contributor on this, but it has been. Tom was my predecessor in this team. You like you said, excessive transparency. Minor. This is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can uh, see who got, has done what. Go on. Yeah, yeah, we've only got a few minutes. I've got a, a comment from Martin Vizier who says that it's wonderful that you're being so candid about open security incidents, which makes me think about one of my other questions. Um, I was wondering, do you have a robust cyber incident process or has that kind of come up as you've been experiencing these small cyber incidences? Um, we do have what we call like, uh, what would I say, uh, an incident uh, retro or postmortem process, like a blameless postmortem process. Yep. Uh, the, we follow a tight sort of agile methodology where we keep on improving our processes as well as like the system itself. Uh, and then whenever one of these incidents happen and we uh, pick it up or our cloud enablement team picks it up, uh, we sort of do a uh, 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 tear down uh, redeploy of the cluster. So we can actually redeploy the cluster using the stack in half an hour to an hour. So being stateless is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have done that recently. Uh, it was actually uh, someone who knew who started and uh, was exploring this cluster de destroyed the control plane. And uh, yeah, yeah, in the development <laughs> cluster. And uh, we, we yeah, yeah, uh, we give high level access to the development cluster just so that people can learn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then we uh, brought, brought everything back in uh, half an hour, an hour. Uh, it was weird. Uh, we probably need to improve our monitoring because the control plane disappeared and um, uh, the, all the applications were still up. It was just we couldn't manage them, monitor them. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> cool. Well, that is bringing us up pretty much to time. We've got less than one minute. Um, thank you so much for that talk. That was really great. Um, uh, coming up next in this channel, we have more talks. There's so much more content to come. Our next talk starts at 11.40 in my time zone, Australia, Melbourne time zone. That's only 10 minutes away. Uh, it's going to be about supporting the BPF, supporting BPF with the GNU compiler toolchain. It's being brought to us from Jose E. Marchesi. So to wrap up this section, please give us all of your digital clicks and claps on Venulus and we'll see you again in about 10 minutes.